problem is, so am I. Quite okay. You can hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Well, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for your welcome too. We're going to begin with um, song number 560, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. It's good to begin with a song of praise and to thank God for him and everything that he's done. Let's go to him now in prayer and just give thanks and ask for help. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we can come here this morning into this place. We thank you that we come for a purpose and we thank you that this purpose is a purpose that you have given to us. Our Father, we thank you as we have sung in our opening hymn a, a song of praise to the, to the God of heaven. Now, Father, we thank you for the truth that you are God and that there is none else. There is none beside you. You are the one who created this world, who brought it into existence by the word of your power. And our Father, we thank you that you sustain and uphold this world by your power. But our Father, we, we think of um, the truth of the words that we've sung and why we're here today. And we, we remember the greatness of your work in this world and the greatness of your love in that whilst you made this wonderful world, our Father, this world came into a condition of sin through the rebellion of men rebellion of man against your express will, your purpose. And our Father, we thank you for the greatness of your work in redemption, that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to do that which we could not do, to do that which we did not deserve, to take our sin upon himself and die in our place upon the cross of Calvary. What greatness is this, our God? And we that is why we sing and sing of praise in our hearts concerning this m wonderful message that uh, Christ died for us sinners. 
Our Father, thank you that he died in our place, that he was buried and rose again and is alive today. And therefore, our great purpose of being here is to speak of the hope that you, our God, give to men. So help us today, we pray. We pray for those not here. We do pray especially for the Bodybuilders Weekend, and we pray for a blessing upon that time, that the young people will be kept safe, that the young people would enjoy their time together. But as Paul was reminding us, our God, we pray that spiritually they might be awakened as young people to trust in the Lord Jesus. Many of us here can look back to trusting when we were children, and we pray that that might be the case for the young people this weekend. Bless Gordon and uh, Penny, we pray, and help them and everybody, everybody involved in that work. We pray for others from this church who are not here. We pray that you would be with them today. And we ask for help now. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go to the Bible readings now. So the Bible readings have been given to me. And um, a collection of verses. You're going through Proverbs. And we have... The subject of the sluggard this evening. Now, I don't know if it's come up on the screen. No, it hasn't. Now, I, I was just thinking to myself, I hope the person who books the speakers wasn't doing a correlation between speaker and subject. But uh, I'll soon find out if I make you fall asleep by the end, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. But we've got the, the topic of the, the sluggard. And the first reading is Proverbs chapter 6. It's, it's mainly the verses given to me, but I have just expanded a couple just to pick up some of the verses around, around the text given to me. So Proverbs 6 and verse 6, <clears throat> and this is probably the one we'll spend the most time on this morning. Proverbs 6, verse 6, go to the ant, O sluggard. Sorry, I'm reading from the ESV. Is, it might be, is that the NIV up there? Do you prefer me to read? For, is that okay? So I, I, ESV, it'd be very similar, but you'll pick up a few differences. Go to the Anto sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep? A little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So I think I added a few extra verses on the end of that reading. Verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Proverbs 13, just one verse, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Chapter 15, verse 19. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. Chapter 22. And verse 13. The sluggard says, There is a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. Chapter 24, verse 30. And I've just added... Uh, I think, a bit to this reading, if this is the one. Um, Proverbs 24, verse 30, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. Um, I haven't added, this is the bit that I added to the first reading, but it repeats, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon 
you like a robber and want like an armed man. The final reading, chapter 26 and verse It says it verse 14, but I would like to start at verse 12, 26, verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. We've come across this already. And there is a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish... It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. And that's the reading for today. So we look to God to bless that to us. And I want to speak now to the children, if that's okay. I'm glad there's some children here. It would have been pretty difficult. Well, the adults might have enjoyed it. I haven't got a quiz this time. I just want to talk to you a little bit about one of the verses that we read together. Now, I should have asked how to do this. Let me get my glasses on and see where the arrow is. Hopefully this is the right way around. No? Oh, thank you. It's not. Here you go. Let's try that. I've done it. Aim it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. (laughs) Right, so I want to talk to you about slugs and ants. Now, that seems very odd. I hope, children, have you got a favourite? Who likes slugs? No? I know the adults probably don't like slugs. They don't like them in the garden. No hands up for slugs. What about ants? Do you prefer ants? A little bit? No, not at all. Neither are your favourites. Okay. Well, I want to talk about slugs and ants. Right. Now, slug isn't a very nice name, really. I think one of the reasons we don't like slugs, that's a horrible name, but the actual biological name, the proper name for a slug is a gastropod. Okay? Now, that's a big name. But if you actually look at what that word means, gastropod, gastro means stomach, And pod means foot. So that's not much of a better name, is it? Stomach foot. Who would like to be called stomach foot? But the ant, his biological name is Formicidae. I had to look this up. I didn't know this. Um, So I've given them names gastro and sid. That's much easier to say. So there, there they are, the slug and the ant. Now there's some famous slugs and ants. Who's come across these famous ones. We've got one called, a slug called Slick. That's a good name for a slug. We've got the ant called Flick. We've got, from Monsters, Inc., a rather formidable slug called Roz, if you've come across her. And we have got Z, or as we say over here, Z, but um, Z and Bala from I think that's from Ants, the film Ants. So it's got some famous slugs and some famous ants. But I'm not going to talk about them. I want to talk about, to you, about the wonder of God's creation because God made slugs and ants. And I'll come on to why I'm talking about slugs and ants in a minute. But they are God's creation. And God made every creeping thing. He even made the slugs and the ants. Now, in the Bible, we learn of a very wise man. He was a king, and he was called Solomon. And he wrote those words that we read together. He wrote Proverbs. And it says in the book of Kings that this man, Solomon, he had great understanding, amazing understanding. And he wrote over 3,000 Proverbs. That's like sayings, special sayings. And he, he said all that, and he wrote it. But he also spoke about bees and birds. He studied nature, and he probably studied slugs, and he probably studied ants. So, what do we know about ants? Now, they are very strong. Did you know an ant can carry 50 times its own body weight? Now, we might think they're small, insignificant creatures, but they can carry massive weights. That's amazing. What about movement? 
Have you ever done a slug race? I've, I've never done a slug race. They're actually snails, but from the same family. Really, a slug is just, as we saw in that joke, uh, uh, a snail without its house. But um, the movement of slugs is amazing. They're just a great big muscle, a slimy muscle. We won't go into the detail. You know, I wanted to bring a slug if I could have found one in the garden, but my wife wouldn't let me. Um, but you know what they do? They, they, they slide along, and they're ever so slow. I had to look this up. They move at 0.18 miles per hour. But you can see them move if you look very, very closely. And there they go. They're just, a, God, they seem a bit lazy, don't they? They just think like, come on, come on. But the, the reality is God made them that way. They're not lazy. That's just the way they are. They're a stomach foot, as we learned, to get, learned together. And they move very slowly. But there is an ant, and it's called the Silver Sahara ant, that moves really, really, really fast. It can move its own body length in one second, its equivalent body length 108 times. I can't remember the figure now, but that works out at something miles per hour. Now, if you equate that to a human, have you heard of Usain Bolt? You might not have heard of him. A very fast runner. And it's the equivalent of him running 800 miles an hour. Now, he's fast, but not even that fast. So these ants, they move quickly, and you've seen ants in the garden, and they do move very quickly. But the most important thing, well, actually, before I say about the most important thing that we want to talk about, is that they have these slugs have um, tentacles. They have four of them, and they use those to see, touch, smell, and they, they go in and out. It's a bit strange. So next time you're in a garden, you, you look at God's amazing creation of a slug. And we might like them a bit better after that. What about the ant? Well, they have two antennae, and they use that to, to touch and smell and navigate and communicate. Amazing God's creation. But the other thing about the ants, and this is the most important thing to remember, is they're workers. They are great workers. They work in teams. They don't have to be told to do their work. They just get on with it, and they do it. And there they are, there's the ants in a row. And you've probably seen this, where ants almost seem to follow each other, don't they? A great big line of ants, and they're, they're carrying their heavy loads of food. Now, one little question for you, a bit of a question. Which is the only continent which doesn't have ants? Is it Europe, do you think? No? Which continent? There's a hand up at the back. Yes, you are correct. And there's an irony in that, Antarctica. And there's no ants there. So that you are correct. But here's the, the last slide. And this is the, one of the verses that we read. Solomon, in his teaching, which is in the word of God, says, we need to look at the ant and learn from the ant. And there's much that we can learn. Solomon tells us not to be lazy. That's what a sluggard is. It's to be a lazy person, so we've, I've abbreviated that to a slug. But um, we need to look at the ant, and God will teach us. He teaches us from his creation. And uh, what does the ant do? Um, the ant gathers and collects and is prepared for the future. So to the children, I would say as we close, we listen to what God says, that we might be prepared for the future, that uh, God has told us what we need to know. So let us have our ears open, our eyes open. Now, I, I hope I haven't stolen the thunder of your um, explorers later, but uh, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about the ant and the slug. Thank you for listening. Children, we've got a, another couple of songs now. That's okay. Um, the first is Christ, our hope in life and death. And then the second one is there is one gospel.
right, I think this is where the children disappear. So as I say, I hope I don't send you to sleep with this, um, but we got the topic of the sluggard. Now, I have to say, I have never, ever spoken on this subject before. I obviously looked at it, but never stood up on a platform and spoken about it. But I found it quite challenging, as I have looked at these passages. And uh, I hope it will be a benefit to you all. Um, just as it was a bit of a recap, no doubt you've been going through Proverbs, but just to remind ourselves, really, of course, what we've read is spoken by uh, the man Solomon... Most of the words in Proverbs are by him. Um, and it's interesting, actually, the first nine chapters, we did um, a while ago a young people's uh, study in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. And the first nine chapters are the sort of more longer uh, pieces. They're like lectures, in a way. But the rest that follows are these little pithy statements, these little terse statements. But the first nine chapters set the foundation for all the rest of the book. And... Um, you know, it uses a lot of imagery, a lot of um, pictures and ideas, and uh, it, it conveys these ideas through these little statements. Um, but it's wisdom literature, and this is the main point of Proverbs. It's to give us wisdom. God's left it for us that we might learn and be wise people. The themes of it, um, well, the purpose of it is to call us to revere God basically because it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and, and that's what the proverb ultimately is looking to do and its aim is to create people that not only fear God and we might fear God in our, our um, reverence toward him but it plays out in our lives that we might fear him in how we live and be wise in how we live and it, its themes deal with all sorts of things, you know, as I say, how we live, how we work, how we manage our time, manage our relationships. And Solomon often used nature and humanity as examples to convey his ideas. It's set in a royal setting often, but also in a family setting. So let's not think these things are not applicable to us. They're very, very up to date. You know, they're, they're about home life, they're about family life. But what about this word, the sluggard? Now, the etymology, that's just a fancy word of where did words come from and where, what, how has their meaning changed? The, the etymology dates back to the 14th century, and it comes from Scandi Scandinavian. So they first used this word, the sluggard. And it's the idea of being habitually lazy. One person who's afflicted with sin... A person who's like that, the sin of being slothful. Now, I could have spoken to the children about the sloth, you know, a very slow-moving creature, but the Bible uses the word slothful as well. And uh, it dates back to the 14th century, and in fact was a surname used in the 13th century, apparently. So there were people called Mr. and Mrs. Sl uh, Sluggard. And... Uh, what actually happened is in the 16th century, that word became transferred to the slug. So the slug was named after lazy people, not the other way around. <laughs> so I've learned that in this study. So the slug has its roots in the word sluggard. Now, our, our famous hymn writer from Southampton, Isaac Watts, wrote a poem about the sluggard. I'm just going to read it to you. So there are just a few verses, and it links to all the verses that we read. This is what Isaac Watts said, and he lived in the 16, late 1600s and early 1700s. He said, "'Tis the voice of the sluggard, I heard him complain. <clears throat> you have waked me too soon, I must slumber again. As the door turns on its hinges, so he, on his bed, turns his sides and his shoulders and his heavy head. A little more sleep, a little more slumber. Thus he wastes half his days and his hours without number. And when he gets up, he sits folding his hands or walks about sauntering or trifling. 
he stands. I passed by his garden and saw the wild briar, the thorn and the thistle grow broader and higher. The clothes that hang on him are turning to rags and his money still wastes till he starves and he begs. I made him a visit, still hoping to find. He had took better care for improving his mind. He told me his dreams, talked of eating and drinking, but he scarce reads the Bible and never loves thinking. Said I then to my heart, here's a lesson to me, that man's but a picture of what I might be. But thanks to my friends for their care in my breeding, who taught me be times to love working and reading. So that's Isaac Watts. And he, he picked up on the theme of what we've read together. So the, the meaning really is to be slack in work, to be um, slothful. And it's more than laziness. It, it contrasts in the Proverbs with the upright. It's more than just a character flaw. It's a moral issue. And I think that's the, the lesson that we need to, to get from this. It's not about being circumstantially poor. There's many poor people in this world, but the poverty that the Proverbs, Proverbs speak about is self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted poverty. That's economic. It, it's about money, but we're going to think about it spiritually too. You know, work and, uh, well, just to say, first of all, that the opposite to the sluggard is to be diligent. And to be diligent requires digging, and, and that's a thought we might come on to later. But I must say, because before you think I'm just talking about sleep being wrong, sleep, of course, is not wrong. Good sleep is really important to us. And God created sleep, didn't he? He, he created rest. He said it's good for us. But he also, cre he also ordained um, work, that work is good for us, in both of them in the right balance. Now, if you think about it, we those of us who are still working or when you did work, um, if you worked eight hours a day, five days a week, that's a fair old portion of our life. But if we sleep eight hours every day, which is supposed to be the good amount for us, that's a third of our life we spend asleep. So if we spend a third of our life asleep, and then a big portion of it at work or school and university and so on, what are we doing with the remainder is, is the question. You know, there's, there's not, it's nothing wrong with having leisure time and there's nothing wrong with kicking back at times just to enjoy things. It can be productive. Um, but really, what is our life about? What is our life's goal? And this is the message of Proverbs. You know, some of us perhaps yearn for Friday. We, we're working, we get to Monday, and we yearn, yearn for Friday because the weekend's coming. And perhaps people in work are yearning for retirement. But there's a bigger picture to life, isn't there? It's just not just about this. And God would draw our attention to what is vastly more important. John Piper, I don't know if you know John Piper, um, he um, did a quite a well-known sermon about 20 years ago, and he wrote a book afterwards, which I did read about 10 years ago, but it's called Don't Waste Your Life. But in the sermon and in the book, he tells a story, and in the, the purpose of the story, he's comparing the life of two women missionaries who've devoted their life to God, and they've served God, and that was the purpose that God had placed on their heart, and they served him. But he compared it with um, something he'd read in a paper of this sort of article promoting the wonder of retirement <laughs> effectively. But it tells a story of um, a couple called Bob and Penny, and they retire early, and, and Bob's 59, Penny's 51. And they, they, they're quite wealthy, they've done well, and they get a big yacht, and they sail around, they live in San Francisco. They, they're really enjoying their retirement. And they, they travel around, and I can't say this in the way that John Piper says it, but he makes the point, and he emphasizes it, and they collect shells. 
And that's what they do in their retirement. But he says it in his very animated way. They collect shells. That's what they're doing. That's, that's it. And they've got this vast collection of shells. And his point is this, is that at the end of the day, whilst, yeah, there's nothing wrong with collecting shells, but they're dedicating their life to that, and it's being held up as this wonderful thing. He said, it's not wonderful. When you get before God in eternity, what is it you're going to say? And John Piper says, look at my shells, Lord. And he compares that with the missionaries who've devoted their time to him. So what we do is important. So I want to just briefly think about what we read together. If that's readable, hopefully it is. So I've just got a few short points to mention. And the first is this from chapter 6 of Proverbs. I want to emphasize the point of being wise and not being asleep. Really, the the poverty, I've already mentioned this, is self-inflicted, but there's hope for the person who is in this condition. And the hope here in chapter 6 of Proverbs is we're being told to look at the ant. So in other words, go, get up out of that lethargic condition and consider the ant, O sluggard. Not just a glance, but consider, study the ant, see how the ant behaves, look at her ways, and be wise. There's wisdom in this teaching. What is the wisdom? Well, the amazing thing is, as it says here in Proverbs, she doesn't have to be forced to work. No ruler, no chief saying, cracking the whip, saying you must do that out of obligation having to work. They do what they do because that's what they do. That's what they're for. And the teacher here, Solomon, is saying to his son, learn from the ant. Not only do they just get on and do it, but they prepare. They work at the right time. They gather. They gather for themselves. They prepare bread. And at the harvest time, it's prepared for the bad times. So there's wisdom. There's wisdom in this. Someone has said that the virtue of wisdom is not in being busy. So it's not just about filling our time. We can be guilty of just being so busy all the time. It's not about that. The virtue of wisdom is not in being busy, but in having a proper view of forthcoming needs that motivates one to action. So that's like the ant gathers for forthcoming need. So there must be a lesson for us in this, that we have a forthcoming need. We have forthcoming needs materially, but certainly there is a need that is in the present regarding forthcoming things in the future, spiritually. So it then goes on to to say, um, why in verse 9, now I added the, the, the part to this reading, it says, how long will you lie there? Oh, sluggard. So in other words, the harvest is going, it's it's started, and they're not doing anything. When will you arise from your sleep? In other words, the sluggard is so addicted to sleepiness, laziness, that it's almost like narcotics are to a, a drug addict. They cannot stop being in this way. This is why it's more than laziness. In other words, they, they, they go to, while they're sleeping and resting, they don't have to worry about the cares and responsibilities in life. So the question is, how long will that person be in this way? And it goes on to say, a little, a little slumber, a, a little folding of the hands. Uh, sorry, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. A little, a little, a little. These things come in frequent surrenders, small but frequent surrenders. Have you got a snooze button on your alarm at home? I have. I, I do thank the Lord for the snooze button sometimes. But it is a bit of a temptation. Now, I, I've taken to, uh, particularly on work days, leaving my phone, which is my alarm, in the kitchen. So I have to get out of bed and go and turn the alarm off. But, you know, it's that attitude in life. Oh, just five more minutes. Just, just a bit more. Just a bit more. And the sluggard 
is like this. Just a little, just a little. And the disaster that falls upon that person is because of the little failures. They build up, and it says that poverty comes like a robber and want like an armed man. It's very serious. So this is more than just being lazy, having lazy moments. This is a, a way of life for this person. So we have one life. How will we use it? Sluggardliness leads to poverty, to a wasted life, and ultimately death. But you know, as Christians, we can be spiritually sleepy, and being sleepy is an enemy of the soul. How do we spend our 24 hours a day? In the scriptures, we can find many examples. The Lord Jesus spoke of of parables, didn't he, that, that taught his disciples of the importance of being awake and, it, and he, he, he spoke of the importance of, of what we do and how we think. And he, he, for example, he spoke of the, the rich fool who had so many crops that he, he didn't know what to do with them. He was abundantly blessed in his, he wasn't poor, but he said, this is what I will do. And he didn't bring God into his thinking. He said, this is what I will do. I'll build bigger barns and I'll say to myself, I'm so take it easy, put up your feet, eat, drink, and be merry. And the answer to him was, for this night your soul will be taken from you. In the Olivet Discourse, the Lord Jesus spoke parables there that, that spoke, and, and not just parables, but teaching, direct teaching that spoke of the importance of um, being, uh, being awake and being ready. He spoke of the uh, parable of the faithful and wise servant, and that's the one who's blessed when the master comes, shall find doing. He spoke of the ten virgins. All of them were drowsy and slept, but five of them had prepared. Five had not prepared at the right time for when the bridegroom came. He spoke of the ten talents. He spoke of the the, the, the three servants who had five and two, and and they invested that money into good use. But the one who said, I feared you, Lord, I, I, I didn't know what to do, so I just buried it. And it had no effect no benefit and he said to him that he was a wicked and slothful servant but the apostle paul talks about sleepiness and sin in romans 13 and verse 11 to 14 he says this the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed the night is far gone and the day is at hand So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. He goes on to say, let us walk properly in the daytime. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And of course, Paul talks in a couple of places about the importance of actual physical work that we're to provide for our families. And not like the Thessalonians who were thinking about the coming of the return of the Lord and said, well, we don't need to work, but we need to be practical as well so the summary of chapter six is this the passage that we read be wise go wake up from the lethargy consider gaze intently learn and be prepared work at the right time when we can work take the opportunity the next text is and i've given it the title be satisfied it was what we read together in proverbs chapter 13. Be satisfied. Don't be like the sluggard who was craving and found themselves empty. We read that the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So there's a contrast in in this verse, and it assumes that God richly provides for all people who are diligent toward him, but he denies resources to the sluggard. Psalm 128 verse 2 says this, You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Now, the interesting thing someone has said is that the sluggard actually desires the gain, the profit that diligence brings. So diligence means working hard at something. Now, we'll come on to this later. You can't work for salvation, but diligence rewards And what the sluggard, he would like the gain of diligence, but without the diligence that gains. So in other words, he wants the gain, but he doesn't want to do the work. 
He would be wise without study and rich without labor. It's interesting in the, in the Bible, we have lovely pictures presented in the Psalms of what it's like to thirst for God, to thirst and hunger for God. And as believers, as Christians, that is what should be the true hunger within us, that we might thirst after him. My soul thirsts for God, the living God, it says in Psalm 42, verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, you are my God. Earnestly will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Now, there's a hymn by um, Francis Bevan, an old hymn. Martin was talking to me when I came in, and he said, uh, in the old days, we wouldn't have iPads and things. We'd have had our, our our bag with our Bible and our Sankey's hymn book. Now, this one, I think, was probably in Sankey's, Martin. Francis Bevan. O Christ, in thee my soul hath found, and found in thee alone, the peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. It goes on to say, I sighed for rest and happiness. I yearn for them, but not thee. But while I passed my Saviour by, his love laid hold on me. I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to take a drink, they fled and mocked me as I wailed. And then the chorus says, now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me, there's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus found in thee. So the summary of this little verse. Sluggards crave, they're always wanting and are never satisfied. The diligent are richly provided for and that satisfaction is only found in God. Third one, we read from Proverbs 15 and and this is about being upright. I'm trying to present the positive, the opposite to the sluggard that we might look at those things. So, The way of the sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. The idea of upright, of course, is to be vertical as opposed to the sluggard, who generally is horizontal. And it has a very spiritual idea to it as well, that the the importance of being upright and an uprightness that we need is the uprightness that God has said that we should be. But of course, we cannot achieve that uprightness in our own strength. It is only a righteousness and uprightness, as it were, that is found through faith in Christ. But we have a, a responsibility to live according to that. Now, the verse speaks to us in this way. It says, the sluggard's way is obstructed. So it's got a hedge of thorns, so it's painful, and it, it's, it's basically blocked. They can't get anywhere. The way is obstructed. They, they want to achieve their goals, But in other words, their spiritual condition stops it. They cannot make progress. Everything is too hard. Everything seems painful. It's even dangerous to try. Now in Matthew 3, verse 3, which is quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3, it's speaking of one John the Baptist who would come and make straight or clear the paths of the Lord. The path of the Lord. And this is the idea. The sluggard's path is hedged with thorns. But the diligent, the upright, they have a level highway. That's like a super highway. It's like an elevated motorway that will take you clearly in the right direction and in the right way. It's not to say that the journey isn't going to be hard, but it's it's a route that will get us to where we need to be. So this is for the upright, that they might be this way and be on that path, have a clear path. And uh, a man called Bruce Watke, who's written a lot on the, the book of Proverbs, said this, those who are wise have internalized the teaching. So in other words, those who listen to the teaching of the scripture, listen to Solomon, listen to God, and they take it in. He says, they move on a built-up highway, clear of obstacles and good for travel. So, summary, sluggards, way is blocked and painful. Faith in God and his word gives uprightness and success. The fourth one, be willing. 
we read in Proverbs 22, verse 13. So in other words, let's not be like the sluggard who was full of excuses. Quite extreme excuses as well. This is the sluggard's excuse for not doing anything. There's a lion. There's a lion in the streets. Now, this is quite a ridiculous thought because this is talking about the city. Yes, in the days when this was written, out in the wilderness there would be lions, but not in the busy, populated, bustling hive of industry and activity. There wouldn't be lions wandering around. Certainly not in the daytime. So... He's worried that he's going to be killed. He says, I shall be killed. Now, that's a word, if you look it up, that's referred often for murder. So, not only is he saying, I'll be killed, he's, he's, he's relating this example to the thought of being murdered. And he's almost saying that anybody who makes me go out to, to work is as good as committing murder. Um, so, it's an absurd claim. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's not willing. He has this excuse. And for the sluggard, no idea, <laughs> no excuse is too eccentric to keep him from work. Now, I'm sure we have all heard examples of why people didn't arrive at work on time or didn't arrive at all. I, I did look up a couple of funny ones, actually. And there was the employee who refused to go to work because his fish was unwell. Now, I, I've heard of dog and cat, but fish is quite extreme. And the employee, this, this has got to be a joke rather than a real excuse, but the, an employee woke up in a good mood and didn't want to ruin it, so they didn't go to work. So that, that, that I feel, has to be made up. But the point is this, for the sluggard, that's extreme. Not to, not to be working, it's an extreme excuse. And the irony is, what really murders him is his laziness, not this imagined lion in the street. So the summary of this one, be willing. Sluggard's excuses are actually nonsense, but the wise are willing. Number five, be sensible. We read in 24 verses 30 to 34 of one who passed by the field of the sluggard. This is what Isaac Newton's poem was about. And he saw a man lacking sense, and basically the garden was overgrown with thorns, the ground was covered with nettles, and the wall was broken down. And he went by and went there again, hoped he'd received instruction, but it was just the same, a little sleep, a little slumber, so on and so on. So as the teacher passes this snoring sluggard in, in his house, he looks at his garden and it's all overgrown. Now a vineyard, in this passage, is used really as a, an example of industry, of effort, of the sweat and work needed to plant a vineyard, maintain a vineyard, protect a vineyard, that it might be fruitful. We haven't got time to look at it, but if you go to Isaiah chapter 5, there's a lovely account there of the wonderful work of God for his vineyard and the work that he did. But that's something to look at another time. So, he passes by and he sees this overgrown garden. It's full of weeds. They've got a stranglehold. They've ruined it. They've broken it down. And this is really what can be the case in the Christian life if we are not careful. I'm thinking of the, the parable of the sower, where the weeds, where the things and the cares of this world can take a stranglehold. Or even if we're not a Christian, something that can prevent us from coming to God, to come to him. Know that we've allowed these other things. We're asleep concerning the things of God. So the summary of this one is the senseless sluggard allows the weeds of the world to take a stranglehold and to destroy. The last one that we read together is from chapter 26 and verses 12 to 16. I added a couple of verses to the front because it, it's saying there's more hope from, for the fool than there is for um, the sluggard. It repeats that expression about the lion, the excuse. So if you read in, the, in your passage, it, it repeats that. And really, for the, the person, the sluggard in this proverb, there's a descent. 
So in other words, he doesn't want to go outside because there's a lion. He's not going to go to work. He's not going to do things because there's a lion in the street. He'll be killed. But not only that, he's actually unable to leave his bed. He's turning like that door hinge. He's just on his bed, as <laughs> Isaac Newton said, with his heavy head. He can't even get out of bed. But not only that, even when he can just about, he's even weary to put his hand in the bowl of his food and bring it to his mouth. There's a, there's a descent in sluggardliness here. And the picture that it is portraying is that is what sluggardliness does. And his irrational fear causes him to stay indoors. But his irrational pride also causes him to think he's right for doing it. The latter part of this verse is saying that the door is swinging on its hinges, the sluggard in his, in his bed. It talks about the dish and it says, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. And this is the tragic point. He's happy in this condition. So the summary of this bit is the sluggard is incapable and weary, but sadly thinks he is right. I want to close with just the final two minutes with this verse from the New Testament. I should have added another word to that. Be awake, watchful, working, and wise. That's the word working. I should have put that in. And this is from Ephesians 5. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. First thing I would want to say today is I don't want to assume that any, everybody here is a Christian. There might be someone here who's not a Christian. If that is the case, we need to think about this, that we need to be raised from the dead. Now you think, well, I'm alive. But the Bible tells us that we're not a Christian, that our sin, the sin that we have that we cannot escape, the sin that plagues us every day and separates us from God is a sin who gives wages, and the wages of sin is death. And we find ourselves in that condition if we're not a Christian. So we need to awake from this. How is that possible? Well, the Lord Jesus did everything. He has done the work that no one else could do. He did the work that we didn't deserve. When the one who is God, came into this world to take our place at the cross of Calvary. And the Bible talks of how that work was this, that he died for our sins according to the scriptures. But it doesn't end there. It says he was buried and rose again the third day. So the Lord Jesus is alive. And therefore we know that if we put our faith and trust in him, we can rise from the dead, as it were, with him and be made alive, born again new life. So I want to present that to you from God's word as the most important point of everything we've said today. Because if you're not a Christian, the Bible tells us that we're in a position of death. But if we are a Christian, we're in a position of life. The light of Christ. But for the Christian, we can also be sleepy. And sleepiness is dangerous. I'm not going to talk about it, but we can talk in our sleep <laughs> physically. We can walk in our sleep. We can sing in our sleep. We can think in our sleep. You apply that to the metaphor of sleep or the simile, then it's dangerous. We can do things without being aware. We can think about things we shouldn't think about. But you know, when we're asleep, we don't know we're asleep. But as soon as we wake, we know we've been asleep. And the good thing is about this message is that God is telling us to wake. And that we might not be deceived. 
The Bible tells us that in latter days, even believers, professing believers, will be deceived. So God is telling us from his word that we need to be awake to what he has said. Redeeming the time, as the authorized says, or as it says here, making best use of the time. That doesn't mean cramming it full. It doesn't mean we've got to just be doing stuff all the time. But it means making what that says, best use of the time. And we need to be awake to do that. Charles Spurgeon said, The man who is asleep does not care what becomes of his neighbours. So in closing, I would encourage myself through God's word and encourage each of us that we might be awake, watchful, working and wise. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Thank you for listening. We're going to sing another song before we have the Lord's Supper. And it's song, it says, Song 14, All Heaven Declares. So just come to the time now when we will remember the Lord Jesus in the breaking of bread. And uh, it's a wonderful time because it takes us straight to Calvary. It takes us in our minds back to that amazing work that he did. Um, I was going to read to you just a, a couple of verses. Well, three actually. The Lord Jesus said in John 9, thinking about work, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. You know, the Lord Jesus worked the works of God. He worked them for us. He worked them for his Father, but he worked them for us. In Psalms 111 verse 2, it says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. There's no greater work than what God did through his son at Calvary. So before we remember him, I'm just going to read to you those well-known verses. Um, they're as found in Matthew's account here of when the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And he said this, Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Shall we give thanks for the bread? 
Our Father, we come to this time and our Father, we would ask that you would open our eyes and hearts to have a, a sight of your, your Son, the Lord Jesus, as he moved in this world, that perfect man, the sinless Son of God, the one who came not to condemn, the one who came to save the one who came to seek and to save that which was lost. And our Father, we thank you that your son never turned away from that task because that task meant that he would ultimately need to go to that which he knew was before him, to Calvary's cross, that not only the people in his day might know something of salvation, but that we, all these years later, might come to know the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. So, our Father, we thank you for this very fact that the, the bread that speaks in picture of his body reminds us that his body was broken for us, that he was nailed to the cross for our sins. He had done no wrong, yet it was for us. All heaven declares the glory of this one, the one who died and was buried and rose again. Our Father, we praise your name as we give thanks now. In Jesus' name, amen. give thanks for the cup and um, we hold on to the cup and we drink it together after I've uh, prayed. Our Father, when we think of this cup and we think of the wine within it, we thank you for its symbolism. We, we thank you that it speaks to us of the blood of the Lord Jesus, your Son. When we think of the Old Testament and the repetition of shedding of blood without which no, no one could come to God following sin's entrance into this world, all the way back from that sacrifice made for um, clothing for Adam and Eve and the acceptable sacrifice of Abel and so on, all through the Old Testament and uh, the sacrifices of the children of Israel that they had to commit so regularly to be have any acceptance before their God. How amazing and how wonderful it is for us, our God, as we take this cup to remind ourselves that what the Lord Jesus accomplished, which everything of the Old Testament pointed toward and looked toward, has been fulfilled. That the shedding of his blood upon the cross was the blood that was shed once and forever for sin, and that you, our God, are satisfied with the work for salvation that the Lord Jesus accomplished. There is no greater work, our God, and we confess this, and we, we thank you this morning that the Lord Jesus was willing. He was one who never made any excuses. He did always those things that pleased you, and he was willing to go all the way to Calvary. What can we do, our God, but just rem bow our knees now? as we humbly acknowledge your greatness and your worth and the great cost that it was to you to send your son to bleed upon the cross of Calvary that he might take away our sins. We give thanks in his name. Amen.
we drink together as we remember the Lord Jesus. We shall close with the final song, which is number 633. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.